Good morning. My name is Mona Yakubian. I'm the Vice President for the Middle East and North Africa here at USIP. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you, both those of you here in the room, as well as our online audience, uh, to today's discussion, which is entitled, A Monopoly on the Use of Force in Libya. We will be examining disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, or DDR, efforts in Libya. Let me say a quick word about USIP. Uh, USIP was founded in 1984 by Congress and works to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict around the world. We do this by engaging directly in conflict zones, including in Libya, and by providing analysis, education, and resources to those working for peace. I'd also like to say a word about our work in Libya. We've been engaged on Libya since 2012, committed to supporting international efforts for advancing peace in Libya. Starting in 2018, our increased field presence has enabled us to engage directly with Libyan actors. From facilitating in-depth dialogues in the Fazan in southern Libya, which have been instrumental in addressing uh, local needs and fostering grassroots reconciliation, to our extensive collaboration with national institutions, including the Presidential Council, our efforts have been deeply focused on fostering inclusive reconciliation. Recognizing the crucial role of DDR in advancing peace and security, USIP remains dedicated to furthering progress on DDR efforts in Libya's security sector. Effective DDR is not just a security measure, it's a cornerstone for advancing peace and economic stability, essential for the peace process. As part of our commitment to the US government's efforts in supporting DDR in Libya, we're actively partnering with the State Department's Bureau of Conflict Stabilization Operations. This partnership focuses on supporting Libyan civilian institutions in the development of a national DDR strategy. Today's discussion is one of the many fruits of our partnership and collaboration. Let me briefly introduce our speakers in the order in which they'll speak. Uh, first, and we're very pleased to welcome Gail Morgado, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Conflict and Stabilization Operation Bureau at the State Department. She leads the Bureau's efforts to anticipate, prevent, and respond to conflict and instability in the Western Hemisphere, Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. She will be followed by Tim Eaton, a senior research fellow in the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. He's the author of the paper launched today on how local forces shape Libya's security sector. His research focuses on the political economy of conflict in the MENA region, with a particular focus on the Libyan conflict. We will also welcome Andrew Cheatham, who will moderate our discussion with Tim, who is our colleague, a senior advisor here at USIP. He is a, a lawyer and former United Nations official who's implemented programs in highly complex conflict and crises environments in the Middle East and Africa, including in Libya. With that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Das Morgado. Das Morgado, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Mona, the United States Institute for Peace, for organizing today's event, and to Tim Eaton for sharing insights from his research with us today. Understanding Libya's armed groups and identifying entry points for future disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration are essential for supporting long-term stability in Libya. The Bipartisan Global Fragility Act of 2019 and the subsequent strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability set forth an innovative long-term approach to addressing conflict, violence, and instability globally. In coordination with the National Security Council, the State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operation leads an interagency process in partnership with the State Department's regional bureaus and missions, USAID, DOD, and Treasury, to implement the strategy in four countries and one region. These are Libya, Papua New Guinea, Haiti, Mozambique, and coastal West Africa. 
both the Global Fragility Act and the strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability recognize that America's prosperity and national security depend on peaceful, self-reliant, and stable economic and security partners. Libya's inclusion as a GFA priority country demonstrates that we are invested in supporting long-term stability in Libya. The Libya's the, the Libya 10-year plan focuses on national reconciliation and an elected government we can partner with that ensures human rights, delivers services, promotes economic growth, and secures its borders. We are pursuing flexible, adaptable approach focused on community-level programs that can be scaled up as opportunities arise to support national elections, access to security, justice, accountability, establishing pathways to reconciliation and disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Regarding this last point on DDR, we are particularly excited to learn more from Tim Eaton about the opportunities and the potential community level entry points for future DDR and he's identified through his research. Thank you for the invitation, and I look forward to today's discussion. Without further ado, uh, to our speakers. Tim, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, Mona and Desmogado for the kind introduction, and for USIP for kindly hosting uh, me here today. Um, I'm delighted to uh, present some of the findings of Chatham House Research, which has been running over the last two years, looking at the development of armed actors in Misrata, Zawiya, and Zintan since 2011. And um, I've got some slides, not too many, um, but I want to take you through kind of some of the, the top level findings and why we're looking at these issue sets. And then hopefully that will open the door for what that might mean for issues related to DDR. So, um, in terms of the project, why have we worked on this? Well, Chatham House has been working for quite some time to try and understand how armed factions have developed in Libya. Uh, there's been a heavy interest, particularly in the forces of Hafta, uh, the LAF. We've written about that in the past. There's also been a lot of discussion, of course, about what happens in the capital, Tripoli. But I had a sense that, for the most part, these discussions focused either on Tripoli or Benghazi, and there are a lot of other areas uh, of Libya and its vast security sector which weren't really being covered. And it was our you know, conviction that actually there are some quite big differences here. And so we selected Misrata, Zawiya, and Zintan, three cities that have come to play a major role in Libya's security landscape since 2011 in different ways. And what we've tried to do um, through a large number of interviews, discussions with um, officials close to the security sector, uh, outreach and interviews with community members is understand how those security sectors have evolved since 2011. We've mapped over 400 um, key individuals, institutions and, um, and armed groups in, across those three cities. And we've tried to get a sense of who they really are um, now, there's a lot of debate, of course, about the nature of Libyan armed groups, and often um, it's become a bit of a policy trope that armed groups are the source of the problem, and that if you could just move the armed groups aside and their vested interests, that perhaps progress in other areas would be much more straightforward. But I think that what you find uh, through this analysis is that things aren't quite so simple. And of course, uh, particularly given the nature of the networks in these cities, and their proximity to the populations, actually, I think the key finding is that these security sectors reflect those city dynamics primarily and map onto the state rather than the other way around. So um, you can see through these images that these are the, the networks that we've been following, trying to understand how they've evolved, and some key conclusions. Um, the first one, which I've hinted towards, is that Actually, whilst you can do um, endless analysis of the 
affiliations of certain armed groups, the creation of new groups, new names. Many of these groups like to change uh, their names quite regularly or create new forces, often with names that are difficult to remember. But um, focusing on key social constituencies and commanders rather than those trends, I think shows you the continuity and the real power dynamics that lie underneath these, um, these local security sectors. And that security sector reflects local conditions. And still, whilst um, this is true to differing degrees, as I'll note, they remain based at their core on social networks that aren't completely distinct from the broader um, local si situation. And as a result, the state affiliations that we see have in most cases proven weak and subject to change. If you follow, and we have all of these groups through their various institutional voyages um, since 2011, you'll find that many of them have obtained state affiliation through all kinds of different um, uh, state institutions from the Ministry of Defense and Interior to the Presidency Council, the Libyan Intelligence Service. And ultimately, though, those affiliations don't necessarily reflect exactly what those armed groups do. There's a very stark difference between what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to be connected to the state to how they actually act. And this is part of a broader debate where we might talk about hybridity, where armed groups are affiliated to the state but not subject to its authority. But I think a good framing point here, and what we're trying to get across is that whilst SSR is supposed to happen by the state subsuming the armed groups under its structures, actually what you've tended to find is that the armed groups have subsumed the state. So it's happening in reverse, and that has pretty major implications when you want to think through uh, issues relating to DDR. So just, I'll just walk you through some of the overall findings from the three cities. They're each very complex in their own right and I could talk about them at some length. And of course, if you'll have specific questions about them, be more than happy to talk. Um, my editors at Chatham House tend to get quite frustrated. The 55 page was the short version in my view, um, but there is a lot of detail to, to cover here. Overall, though, I think starting off with the city of Nisrata, which has kind of become seen as a bulwark of the revolution since 2011, it's got some really interesting dynamics which distinguish it as a, um, as a and distinguish its local uh, security apparatus. And particularly the relationship to the between the community and the groups is very interesting. Um, we find, and, and some may contest this, but certainly from the testimony of Misratans themselves, that support for the goals of the revolution, certainly rather than formal state authority, remains at the center of the social contract between the community and its armed groups. And that's really important, of course. Uh, the majority of Misratans that have fought since 2011 also don't belong to the military and don't necessarily have a sense of hierarchy and command. And in this sense, you've kind of got a duality of the Misratan security sector. When, when the city is not engaged in a major conflict, it the, large, the preponderance of its armed men are, are demobilized and they are basically remaining in the city. And the state affiliated elements of the Misratan security apparatus issue orders and they're followed. But when it comes to war and the city mobilizing, then it kind of transforms into a much wider um, social mobilization that requires everybody's buy in and is not following the orders of the state or even necessarily just some key commanders. There's a dialogue in that. Misrata's security sector has been the focus of some reform efforts locally, internationally. And in some sense, um, we found that there was a success in installing a military hierarchy and training new recruits. But actually, when you look beneath them, and there's a, a table in the paper which shows you that many even of the new um, armed factions have their origins in revolutionary groups. And actually, the influence of those groups remains on those revolutionary um, origins and those connections. And that's really important to remember. Um, the clear examples of this are brigades 166, 301, uh, the Joint Operations Force and the CTF, each of them having their origins in, in revolutionary factions. We found that within the city, um, the Ministry of Interior affiliated forces had really kind of consolidated their authority since 2015 uh, via the Misrata Security Directorate. 
And that, that directorate continues to seek support both from that joint operations force and um, a special support force to um, act within the city. And this was effectively something that there was consensus on and a lot of support for. Yet whilst the other elements of the security sector, the, the more formal elements, of course, um, a key commander from Misrata, from the, formerly of the Haubus Brigade, is the chief of the general staff, and his efforts to expand um, the armed forces under the formal aegis of the, military, uh, of the central military zone, um, whilst those groups have expanded, still we don't see them as being influential and we don't see them as able to access resources and funds and act, particularly when it matters. At the same time, this dual face of the security sector remains, and actually some of the most prominent revolutionary factions within Misrata remain completely unconnected formally to the state's institutions. Those key commanders and this social mobilization remains a key part of the story within the city. Moving to Zawiya, quite a different um, uh, story to tell here. I mean, basically, Zawiya um, has become increasingly significant in Libya's security landscape and in political negotiations, particularly since 2019. Its strategic position on the outskirts of Tripoli has led uh, rival national factions to seek to um, obtain support from them and to be able to then utilize that position to uh, wield influence and control over the capital. But actually what you see from the, the Zawian example is quite different to the Misratan one, where the many Misratan groups since 2011 have remained based on core social constituencies and have some have partly formalized, others remain subject to a social mobilization as I mentioned. Really in Zawia what you've got is straight out competition, zero sum, um, battles over key strategic interests and a lot of it related to the illicit sector. Two main axes of power have uh, emerged in the city based on familial ties and from neighborhood locations, which has also dictated um, the means through which the Zarian security sector has obtained affiliation with the Libyan state. So these groups, most of them didn't play a significant role in 2011 fighting have utilized their position and control of the illicit sector to expand into what almost seem like kind of conglomerates and then use that influence to leverage with the state to obtain formal recognition. And of the two um, factions that we see, two axes as I would call them, got the central Zawiya axes, axis of Mahmoud bin Rajab and Mohammed Bahroun being two key commanders. And they bring largely uh, factions together from the Aulad Saka tribe and family-based groupings lo located in the center of the city. While a second um, antagonistic axis has been built on the Abu Humaira tribe under the leadership of armed groups headed by the Abu Zariba and Kushlaf families, two sets of three brothers, um, which control southern Zawiya and the refinery, although this is becoming increasingly under pressure in recent weeks and months. As I noted, those two, um, two axes have largely been formed through competition over control of economic interests, mostly in the illicit sector. And um, those actors have effectively dictated the terms on which they've engaged with the state. The politicians have sought to reward Zawiya's armed groups for their loyalty with resources and legitimacy, particularly in recent years. And this led, has led to um, them being increasingly integrated into the state structure. However, there hasn't really been much that's come with this in terms of efforts to professionalize local forces or break their existing chains of command. Those local forces have been able to dictate. Um, one key um, development was when the Abu Humaira axis was formalized in the stability support apparatus, while the central Zaria axis has been formalized through the Ministry of Defense's West Coast military zone. These two axes have backed different candidates in the last couple of years, with, um, with the SSA basically falling and, and seeking to support um, Fatiba Shaga's uh, government. And of course, one of the Buzariba brothers being a minister of interior of that government, whilst the, um, the opposing axis has supported the incumbent Beba government. And we've seen over the last, um, last year, mostly the six, nine months, that there's been quite a lot of fighting in and around Zawiya 
as those proxy battles continue to play out um, following Bashaga's fall. Moving to Zintan, um, again, you kind of get a slightly different set of dynamics and a very complicated set of dynamics where Zintan kind of played this very outsized role immediately after 2011 in occupying key areas of the capital. But really, since 2014, Zintan's security sector has fractured significantly, and there have been parallel processes of integration with Eastern and Western-based authorities, and it really is quite a jumble trying to follow how these groups have moved through their formal affiliations. But if you do extract from the, the uh, minutiae of those dynamics, you can see that it's key Zintani commanders that are leading um, the negotiation between Zintani armed groups and the state. And um, these I'll, I'll talk about shortly. In a way, you can talk about Zintan's armed groups being based on four factions. Um, some are pro uh, the, the government's national unity. Some have been pro Libyan Arab armed forces of Hafta. Some are pro uh, Gaddafi, and others even position themselves as neutral. However, there's quite a lot of overlap between them. And as I noted, I think judging these groups based on those um, affiliations is a very weak, uh, is a limiting way of understanding them. Some groups have taken uh, pro-LAF and pro-Gaddafi positions simultaneously, which you might think is somewhat contradictory. And while others have technically remained part of the GNU, even though they don't recognize it. So I think this kind of speaks to the, um, the complexity of, of, this, of, of Libya's local features. But in terms of the key commanders who have kind of led the charge, really Assam is the is the main name since 2011 who's been omnipresent, but also um, Imad Trabelsi. They've both acted for fo as focal points for the pursuit of Zintani interests through state authorities in the capital. Uh, this was particularly notable when Jweli was Minister of Defense, and of course uh, Trabelsi is currently Minister of Interior of the GNU, um, which is a way of the GNU keeping the Zintanis enough on site. Um, Zintan's relations with Hafta and the LAF must be seen in the context of the developments in Tripoli of, of the outbreak of the 2014 war, as elements of the Zintan Military Council broke off to join the LAF. And in this sense, the narrative of the Zintanis of the uh, 2014 conflict is one of betrayal, that they were stabbed in the back by other groups, notably um, those from Misrata, whereas the Misrata narrative is that they saved the revolution and prevented counter-revolution by entering. These narratives are super important. Um, Hafter um, used links with religious and tribal leaders in Zintan to kind of bolster these connections, particularly with the elements of the Zintani armed groups that affiliated themselves with the Eastern authorities. For them, these were the legitimate authorities and they followed that authority. But by 2016, under Jweli, there had been a reconciliation under the Government of National Accord. However, despite all of these different dynamics and fighting on different sides, particularly in 2019, uh, where you actually have Zintani armed groups fighting on different fronts, on different sides of the conflict, they never came into direct um, conflict, and that wasn't an accident. That was very heavily, um, uh, there, was a, there was a big social effort to ensure that that didn't take place. Um, and just finishing off on the, on the Zintan point, in that sense, though, really, there is a slight opportunity at the moment because after all of these different affiliations and after the ostracization of Jweli from um, the GNU, actually the majority of Zintani armed groups are now announcing that they are willing to work together. But basically, it's the Minister of Interior, Trabelsi, who is keeping the GNU connected um, to uh, dynamics in Zintan. But Zintan therefore now presents quite a looming threat for the GNU's forces. So I probably sp spoke already for too long about those aspects, but um, you can see that they're complicated and there's much that we can delve into. When looking at um, the community's perceptions of armed groups, this is something which is quite difficult to obtain. We worked really hard to speak with as many members of of the communities as we could with a good cross-section. Uh, but there were some really strong takeaways that despite um, all of the criticisms of the armed groups, about many exist, um, 
there was a near consensus in all of the cities that they needed their own armed forces to protect the city, otherwise they would basically be subject to domination and um, devastating consequences. And so those armed groups are still seen to play an important, if imperfect, role in protecting their respective cities. And that's something that's kind of been a bit um, pushed aside by a lot of the international discussions around these, these groups who are seen as overly self-interested. But there's a real difference. In Misrata, this looks different. The footprint looks different. Um, there's not so much permanent mobilization. Same in Zintan. Those groups are seen as providing a more socially accountable role. Whereas in Zawiya, there's a continual presence of the armed groups, and that was seen as oppressive. In fact, we really struggled to get people from Zawiya to tell us anything about armed factions, because there's a real climate of fear. And that's, I think, one of a real key difference. Um, similarly, what these cities saw their role as being within Libya was quite different. For the Misratans, they saw themselves as having kind of a national role. But while they could agree on um, their security sector protecting them, there's a kind of uncertainty about what Misrata should do beyond its borders. In Zintan, I think there's kind of become a conviction after the failings of, or the disaster of 2014, that they should just focus on themselves and they should focus on protecting their interests, protecting access to Tripoli, and protecting their business interests. Whereas in Zawiya, um, the armed groups were seen as very, much, very, very limited, um, having very limited accountability to the community and very much self-interested. I think I can skip through this a little bit. I just want to emphasize one point here, um, which I think is important for the discussion to come, in that when the armed groups operate within their city bounds, they're seen as being uh, under the city's social umbrella. And that provides you know, some kind of expectations and limiting um, role over the behaviors that they exhibit. But once they go outside of the city and once they operate somewhere else, most of the community members were keen to disown those groups. They saw them as then becoming mercenaries or pawns of politicians and part of a broader problem. And I think this speaks to the, um, the dilemma in a way that the legitimacy that exists exists locally and it's very difficult to transpose that onto any form of national force which is not seen as being um, a national force. It's seen as being self-interested and uh, connected to particular um, backers. In the paper and in the work, we've done quite a lot of explaining why these armed groups operate differently depending on what's available in the area. I mean, clearly within Misrata, Misrata is a, a very uh, successful city with a buoyant um, business sector. Um, there are a larger number of opportunities available there, whereas when we looked at uh, Zawiya in particular, it's difficult to see if the armed groups don't do the trafficking and the um, and the infiltration of state institutions that they currently do, what the alternatives will look like. And in fact, all of these groups have been quite effective in covering their salaries and operating costs through the state and obtaining political patronage. And that can be in state-owned enterprises where cousins of these leaders have now become placed on the board despite no, um, having no qualifications or increasingly, I think, seeking political power directly. That's something which we're going to see more and more. And if there were elections, I think um, people like Fred Wery have made the point that these groups would seek to run many of their own candidates, which would maybe not therefore bring some of the outcomes that the international community would assume would come with an election. But also there's a key dynamic of monetizing territorial control. For the most part, these groups remain based in the areas where they're from, and they seek to control protection markets, trade routes, and trafficking. That looks different in the different places, but particularly notable in a place like Zintan, that the community were quite open in saying that they thought that it was the armed group's role to help Zintanis pursue those business interests and push others out. So when you're becoming, having a discussion about DDR or alternatives, these social port ports of buy-in are quite important things to, um, to cover. So, um, I'll wrap up uh, in the next minute or so, but just to conclude from this, so we've got three very different security sectors with some commonalities, but clearly based upon local dynamics. Um, and the very straightforward conclusion, I think, from that is that any DDR process that's going to take place in these locations needs to be 
tailored to those local um, dynamics. And I'll offer some thoughts as to what that looked like. Moreover, because these are social networks that are embedded in communities, the process must also be social and not limited to the armed groups themselves. They're not a separate part of society. You have to broaden the conversation. I think in engaging communities more widely, one of the goals has to be, therefore, to limit the amount of influence that armed groups are playing in the conversation by making it all about security or by placing them in the top rooms to decide, then that's also facilitating their, um, their growth. And when looking at different literatures about DDR and SSR, how to plan it, how to sequence it, it's clear that this is a deeply complex issue and very hard one. But it's important that DDR can't wait. There's some, there's some um, conclusions that it's just too early, given all of the circumstances I've mentioned. But when will that point come? What we actually see is that this is a dynamic situation. Looking at our network analysis, following how these groups have become more and more um, embedded and integrated and controlling of the state's interests, if you wait for the stars to align, it's just going to become harder. So I offered some thoughts in terms of what this might look like in practice, so that would offer almost a bit of a toolkit. If you're looking to engage in one of these cities, how would you decide um, what, what you would look to do or how you would support it. And um, I've offered some, some thoughts here, um, particularly, of course, the state of mobilization of the local forces in areas where the armed groups aren't permanently mobilized gives you a lot more of a window to um, engage. And particularly those forces that are permanently mobilized are also generally the ones that have consistent access to state resources, and that's hard to switch off through a DDR process. I think one of the key measures has to be about increasing the level of accountability locally, as I've mentioned. So we've generally found that the violence is lower in these um, localities when the degree of social accountability is higher. So what kind of interventions can be done to Im improve that, increase that? You know, one idea is to have councils that will um, provide a link between citizens and the armed groups to um, negotiate and, and talk about how the groups can and should operate. And I've suggested that in this sense, um, there may be means of providing incentives towards doing that. Um, in terms of alternative economic opportunities, I think um, it's clear equally here that the training measures are going to have to be catered to specific localities. But there's a need, I think, to pivot the, to some of this discussion away from solely on the security sector to being more about um, things like local economic development and creating milestones where that you can create a virtuous circle by um, having negotiations between armed groups and the community, but then also providing some benefits to those community that will show that um, there are benefits to be gained by the demilitarization, effectively, of those communities. Andrew, I think I've talked for way too long, um, but hopefully that gives a, a sense of, um, of the landscape in these places and then some, some practical implications for policy. Why don't you come sit down and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for this. I mean, for people who, who are familiar with, with Libya, it's a fascinating uh, analysis, very necessarily granular. Um, nothing can be done in Libya unless we have this level of detail as far as international assistance programming, supporting Libyans lo at the local level, at the national level, unless we have this, this level of analysis. I think a lot of people who are not familiar with Libya might not know how complex it can be, um, you know, and how fractured and atomized. Um, and I think we met originally, I think, or, uh, some years ago when we were working on the the Libyan Expert Economic Commission uh, with Ansmil, and and that also has its problems, you know, as far as decentralization, and and I think all of these things are connected. But understanding that there is no federal system, there is no sort of nested way of of governance. It it, it applies to the security sector as well. Right. So I think you know it's really important that people understand this local dynamics but it takes a really long time and people that have worked on Libya for a long time like yourself to understand this and and, and support uh, the type of programming that, that would need to be done to to 
to help the security forces uh, in DDR and SSR. But I want to just take one second, just a couple minutes, to, to take a few steps back for a few people in the room who may not be as familiar with the Libyan context. And I, I want to just start where sort of I left off and working with you and see where the project of state consolidation is as far as economic and politically. So just briefly for, for, for everyone here, could you please talk about the state of the political transition? We know that people are trying to move towards elections. We had uh, W Assistant Secretary mention that, and we know it's a big project. We've missed some, some milestones on that. Um, and then there's the economic front. So can we start with sort of the political transition and, and the state of play where we are? Um, can you just give us a snapshot of, of w w where we are with that? Sure. So I think um, the internationally mediated political track um, has continued to seek to affect elections in Libya based on the conclusion that only through elections can the current set of uh, decision makers be replaced and can broader markers uh, for progress be reached in terms of a, having a, an elected government that has a mandate to make the changes and to push forward the many, um, against the many challenges that the state faces. Unfortunately, though, I think if you step back and look at that process, the number of people involved in those negotiations has diminished over the years, and it's become increasingly a discussion about getting key actors to sign on to something that, at the very least, they can't be sure that their interests will be served by backing. So you've got this situation where the political track is seeking to have an open um, competition upon which Libyans can place their vote, but all of the key uh, Libyan players are seeking to control the outcome and only sign on if they know what the outcome will be, which is kind of uh, you know, counterintuitive. And we're at the point now where much of the SRSG's effort is about bringing together what they call so-called a, a, the a big five. Unfortunately, lost in that broader set of negotiations are other representations from the Libyan population. And in this impasse, which has continued, and the vacuum of a broader political process, you've seen the armed groups kind of make hay. The political figures know that if they're to succeed, they're gonna to need to be able to cut a deal. You saw Fatih Bashaga, for example, um, straight up cut a deal with armed factions, which he had concluded were beyond the pale and needed to be um, completely demobilized whilst he was Minister of Interior, to say, realizing that to be able to get into the capital, he needed their support. So. The armed groups come from a set of networks that were quite distanced largely from that political power in 2011. But they're pretty quick studies. They've learned fast. And I think the fact that we have two ministers of interior for the rival governments based, you know, one is a Zintani um, uh, armed group figure, the other is a Zawian armed group figure, shows you the direction of travel that we're going here. And I think. This is a, a form of consolidation in a way, but it's very volatile. And we're seeing a lot of struggles on the Northwest Coast at the moment. And it is a, like a, sometimes that's been held up as stability, but actually I think what you're seeing is a narrowing of interests here and a form of state consolidation, which is based purely on extracting the state's resources and not putting anything back to the public. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't watch it every day like I used to, but it seems to me that as we move in that direction, there is a sit, there's a bit of a, of a, a gap between what the intentions are of Libyans and of the international community to support uh, an inclusive process, the national reconciliation process, the national dialogue that's been talked about, supported by the African Union and others, and also what's going on at the community level, very directly applicable to what you're talking about in DDR. Mm -hmm and where the real power brokers are and right. what they're taking seriously and, 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 and whether or not there's a cynicism about these sort of other efforts. We have to, I think, well, I'm not, but anyway, I would think that, we, that people would need to break down this, this cynicism and, and really blend these two things, including the social aspects that you talk about in the DDR process, so that they're serious. But I think to do that, you need to bring in uh, leverage for certain players uh, at the national level and the local level. So let's let's get into that when you, I'm glad this slide is up and we can talk about how uh, particularly 
integrating the local social accountability within the DDR process is possible without you know programming that's just distinct from the realities on the ground. But just for a moment, because I know this is another area of your expertise, could you give us a, a two-minute overview of the sort of economic conditions with a focus on uh, where we are with sort of the development process and there are some big investments, foreign investments going into Libya as I understand it and, and, and the oil sector still continues to pump out. Uh, so the sort of macroeconomic factors quickly um, and then jump down to this effort of equitable distribution of the revenues and how those efforts are or are not working because I think this plays into the, the overall stability and then we'll get back into the DDR conversation. Sure. So. As I was intimating on the political side, I think that the, there's been a search for this Libyan-led process. I think actually that the political process is now Libyan-led by these key figures and that that's being reflected and responded to by the internationals rather than directly mediating it. And I think you can apply the same in the economic space. Um, you can see that the interests of armed actors um, have become more proximate to power. I mentioned appointments to um, uh, to key state-owned uh, enterprises, and um, we've seen increasing pressure come on the oil sector in, an, um, in, a, in a largely unprecedented fashion, I think, actually, in the last couple of years, as the deals being cut between these rival factions have kind of moved upstream and closer to the sources of funds. And that's something which is, um, I think, in reaping increasing damage upon the economy. So one of the things that Libyan economists have pointed out recently is that, you know, if you look in the black market, the dinar has fallen at a time where there isn't a broader oil crisis. You know, actually, I think sometimes these things on the economic side can be harder to see, and often international interests are whether the oil keeps flowing, um, but th the ability of the state to maintain this degree of pervasive, like rapacious, extraction I think is going to come increasingly under threat and there's no there's no mechanism to uh, incentivize any of these players to to limit what they take and this is kind of a problem so on the economic side I think that you're seeing very open deals being cut and even I think after the horrendous tragedy of, of Derna and the Green Mountain which I think according to some statistics may have killed more people um, than all of the conflicts in 2011 combined. So that shows you as well, um, these are things that Libyans care about. Nobody resigned. There's no East-West deal over how to, how to reconstruct that yet. And we're a few months on. So this kind of national level malaise, I think um, also gets to your point about what you can do locally. And, and these are where the opportunities are um, more clear and present. Of course, that creates other challenges in terms of how you are able to, to pursue locally based strategies without frustrating or further pushing back on kind of state level efforts. And I think this is where I've tried to come up with some ideas as to how you might create approaches which are replicable in other areas and, and, and incentivize and change the conversation away from just being about um, whether you can control this en entity or that entity and making it more of a virtuous circle in terms of unleashing economic incentives um, and uh, empowering and helping to empower local communities push back against some of the worst excesses of, of the armed groups. Thank you for that. So finally, I just wanted at the, the last snapshot question, and we, I've noticed in the report, several, you said in all, this, all three cities, Misrata, Zintan, and Zawiya, the, the residents all voice some concern of an outbreak of national level violence. So with that political and economic sort of outlook that you provide, and you have these snapshots there, but you obviously follow the broader security um, situation. We've had outbreaks of violence in Tripoli. You've had crackdowns in Benghazi as fairly recently. Um, what do you think is the, the probability of a, of a further national level uh, violence? Because it obviously will play into any any plans we have for DDR? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to note that these are the perceptions of the community members. So those perceptions are colored by previous rounds of conflict. And many of um, these communities have paid the cost, uh, paid the price of those conflicts in terms of lost family members, lost sons, damage 
things that still haven't been put right. We're talking about reconstruction in Derna. There are a whole bunch of places that have been devastated by conflict in Libya that have had no little um, to no um, reconstruction take place. Um, but it's clear that the dynamics that we see, which is a kind of kind of Hobbesian power struggle for direct extraction of resources, is more likely to result in an outbreak of further conflict because the one mechanism that the state has developed to deal with that is to basically parcel out more resources and that they're finite. Particularly on the northwest coast though where that territorialization, uh, monetization of territory is so critical in terms of controlling routes, you can see that actually there's quite a large, um, quite a high potential for further significant outbreaks of fighting there and we've seen over the course of this year um, drone strikes in, in Zawiya by the, by the GNU claiming to target criminal elements, but it happened to be the areas which were controlled by the groups which were antagonistic to the GNU. We're seeing Zawiya refinery come under the, in the crosshairs. So I think that's likely to be the face of ongoing fighting. It's likely to be battles over those kind of parochial interests. That being said, you can also see a scenario in which um, in the efforts to create a new technocratic government, I would invert the commas over that technocratic part, um, there's going to be a negotiation in the security sector and you've got a large, like the preponderance of the Zintani security sector on the outside looking in, in terms <coughs> of the state. You've got the Abu Myra who are, who are very antagonistic as well. You've got ambitious um, central Zawiya axis. So we're constantly seeing these um, these uh, limits being tested. And also this year, it's worth noting that we saw quite significant fighting in a civilian area between Tripoli-based mm. armed groups. So it seems a bit more difficult to envisage a LAF attempt to at something being replicated like Hafter's attempt to take over Tripoli. But I think sometimes the lack of country-wide fighting has been perceived as stability from the outside. But this is really inherently not stable. And there isn't a conversation around these things which are very closely wedded to issues like DDR that's taking place that's credible in my view. So now I'll leave it to, to the audience to talk specifically. We've got some DDR experts in, in, in IFC here and uh, several friends and colleagues. Um, uh, so yes, we'll just take hands now. I think there's a mic coming around. First of all, uh, fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I really, I really, um, flipping through the report and hearing you speak, this, this really, really needed to be written. I just, it's just a wonderful, and I, I'm thinking sort of Clifford Geertz, you know, we needed an ethnography of, uh, of, of, uh, of Libyan militias with, with case studies to really dig into what all the issues are. And I love the choice of cases because of the way they contrast. Um, the, um, there's an ethnic side of this, which you sort of hinted at in Zintan, that I wondered if you could comment on the whole Berber side of this, and 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 uh, um, I don't know if it's in the report. Um, there's also armed groups prior to 2011. I don't know if you looked into that, but like in Ronin's book, the the drug gangs, the Revcoms. I was wondering if you could comment about the pre-revolutionary militias and how that fit into this, um, and let's call it, to keep the question short, uh, traumas, right? The, the trauma of Gaddafi, the trauma of the Civil War, the trauma of the 2014, um, sorry, the uh, 2011 revolution, the 2014 the, the assault in 2019. I mean, there, there's two aspects. When I think of militias, it's, it's partially the embeddedness in the local context, which you're absolutely right about. Maybe that is the most important thing. But it's also the revolutionary posture of most of them uh, and it's the um, uh, protection of the community um, uh, against those fears, you know, almost explaining to some degree why the, 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 the Zawians are so nervous about um, even talking about it, right? That, that ties back to those traumas. I mean, Zawia is one of the most understudied sites of, of the massacres of 2011. Um, which the story still hasn't been told except that short documentary that was locally produced. Um, so 
so three other little things you can um, just respond to if you want to. You, you may remember that crisis group with with SS with um, small arms survey did that survey in 2012, taxonomizing the militias into four groups: revolutionary, post-revolutionary, uh, and then the small ones, the illegals and the um, and the uh, jihadist. Uh, the, the second two, the third and fourth category being really small. I was wondering if that kind of played into your thinking, because the post-revolutionary versus the revolutionary is really important. Uh, that the the second little thing you might want to respond to is um, we often get informal economy wrong, and I was wondering if you could distinguish between black economy and what you might call gray economy, because I think we always talk about the bl the black side of what the militias are involved in, and not just provision of local services, you know, and and, and illicit but gray and necessary economic transactions, uh, which is huge. The same Toyotas, the same, you know. And then the, the last thing is, um, and riffing off of one of the things you said about two-thirds of the way through, um, what if it's just the case that DDR and SSR are impossible until you have the ultimate peace deal and the ultimate reconciliation because these groups see themselves as Minutemen, I'm from Boston. <laughs> you know, that just de defending the community until they don't need to keep those weapons anymore. What if it's just, so what if we're just planning, planning, planning? That's fine, you know, but planning until we have the ultimate reconciliation and then the DDR and SSR, as you're implying through the whole talk, is an organic thing that grows out of the macro resolution rather than thinking as is often wrongly analyzed that we have to kind of force things before. Libya is at peace with itself. Thank you so much. Do you want to take some of those? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bill. Very, very good points. Um, on the revolutionary side, I think this is an interesting one um, because it's also there's a question of what it means to be revolutionary as well, which is different in different cities. So Libya can be one of the most frustrating places to kind of draw um, blanket <laughs> conclusions. But the experience of revolution across these different cities is very different. And the roles, as I in intimated, that those cities see themselves as playing is different. And so for the Zintanis, you know, having some accordance with the uh, elements of the former regime was a sensible decision. That w was in by no means a, a, a betrayal of the revolution, but for many in Misrata that was. And I think there's a question of, of what it means to be revolutionary today, and I think that's even more complicated um, as the, um, the affiliations and the, and the negotiations become muddier. You know, you've got uh, a lot of lines being crossed, particularly through illicit, um, illicit interests. With your point on the taxonomy of, you know, what's a revolutionary group versus an outright criminal group versus... Um, you know, a more formal group. I've found m that mostly impossible to distinguish um, when you go locally. And this may be an overly uh, sympathetic view, but the preponderance of the groups that are focused on criminal sources of revenue are largely in the areas where there aren't as many alternative sources of revenue available. Um, and also, the social origins of those groups tend to be from lower socioeconomic backgrounds as well. So they've gone for more direct forms of uh, revenue generation. So in that sense, militias versus armed groups, and we've had a lot of discussion about hybridity and, and, and things like that here, but it seems to me that those local perceptions and those local understandings remain the dominant feature still. So I think you've got to engage with those and try and come up with some common goals in terms of the roles that the armed groups should play within those communities. And now, don't want to oversimplify that, in a place like Zawiya, transforming its economy is a, an incredibly big challenge, particularly when you don't have a national development strategy, you don't have development spending unlocked, you know, you've got... So it's really, really difficult to see some of these things, but... Um, I do think that having that local understanding, you also mentioned about um, you know, things based around ethnicity. People's understandings of what's going on are very, very localized. And this is, I think, this dilemma that you can achieve most locally, but 
those local balances of power might also be quite unjust to elements of the community as well. So how do you do that? And how do you do that in a way which doesn't frustrate a national process? That seems to be the main, the main challenge. And I would just say in terms of whether that follows a, a big deal, I think that these uh, processes are so dynamic that these groups are still growing, that if you wait, it will be too late. Um, and so I think you've got to actually try and look at changing the nature of the conversation and doing what you can while you can, accepting that there will be limits to that. Um, and just finally, on the, the black and grey economy, well, yeah, so found some interesting examples of Zintani armed groups basically strong-arming people into contracts in the oil sector. Formal contracts that get audited, but very clearly, there were some companies that won, and they had some connections, and the other com companies did not. And so, you know, right, right. Um, there's some service provisions. So you found Zawian armed groups basically offering um, grandmothers access to banking services that they would otherwise be, uh, be unable to get. But why were they able to operate, uh, offer that? Because they were basically dipping their finger in the bank. So, you know, the, there's a lot here, and I think increasingly distinguishing as well between Libya's formal and informal black and white economies is, has become kind of um, impossible because most economic activity, activities seem to have an element of, of both. And everybody is reliant on the black market these days, which is why you see some of the biggest political discourse come around when the black market rate skyrockets because it has such a direct impact on people straight away and what they pay for things, what they've got. Um, so I, hopefully I covered some of those things. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Yes, we Mona. Sorry, I have to yield to the vice president. <laughs> With two, two colleagues. I'll make it very quick. Thank you so much, Tim. This was fascinating. Um, it's a clear takeaway that it's local dynamics, hyper-local dynamics, it sounds like, that really drive an understanding of these armed groups and therefore efforts at DDR. One question that came to mind, though, as you were speaking, if it's relevant, is the role of foreign fighters. Uh, and is there an intersection between Wagner or other foreign fighters who may be on the ground? I don't, I'm not current on Libya. I don't know if there's still Syrian fighters on the ground or others. But to what extent, if at all, um, does that factor into your analysis? Thanks. We'll just go one for one. I was told that's what I'm supposed to do. OK. okay. Um, it, it's, it's a really good question. I think um, in the analysis we were doing on the LAF a while ago, this was a, a bigger factor. Um, but it was notable um, that many people told us, for example, that Shueli's forces included a large number of, of mercenaries and foreign mercenaries. In these three cities, I don't see the role of foreign fighters to be particularly influential, though in each of the contexts they exist um, to p play specific roles. Um, overall, I've tended to find that um, there's some quite slightly perverse findings that after 2000, the 2019-20 war, the presence of foreign militaries have probably helped to prevent a larger outbreak of conflict. Um, but still, you do see um, foreign fighters deployed in a number of locations. And particularly with relation to the South, this is highly controversial with issues over citizenship um, and, um, and uh, nas nationality. Um, I think fundamentally, it's not a very good answer to your question, but where I think they come in in these contexts is that it's the ability to coercively control key assets that allows these armed groups and their broader communities to benefit from um, the resources of the state. So as long as that remains the kind of dynamic, I think you're going to continue to see those types of actors be employed, particularly when there is a, uh, an, a large outbreak of conflict. So Jueli was probably using those figures because he needed to, um, he needed to move and control further territory. And actually, trying to work out just how many men at arms in each Libyan group is a very difficult thing. This isn't a military analysis at all. But it was clear that to do that, he also needed to draw upon additional resources. And they used the money to pay for foreign fighters to do that. So 
but I don't see them playing an autonomous role within these three cities. Just a two finger on that, and Chris, I'll come right to you, and I know we're running out of time, but even in the Mizrahtan case, not foreign fighters or mercenaries, but foreign military Turkish f fighters, and the ties between Mizrata and Turkey for long standing, does that play into post-2020 uh, security dynamics? I mean, what, what about that aspect of it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the role of Turkey is, is central. If you look in Tripoli, you look at the 444, um, the recent outbreaks of fighting. Um, there's a social kind of element to that in terms of these armed groups that have come out of the Tripoli suburb of Sukhujuma and Mahmoud Hamza, the head of the 444, being kind of seen as the anointed one by Turkey and getting too big for his boots, I think is the essence of why that fighting took place. But Turkey is... Uh, running some of its own um, programming here. It is um, training groups, particularly groups like the 444. And there are key commanders that have had longstanding relations with, with Turkey and have sought to draw upon those resources to um, improve the equipment and training of their, of their armed groups. I think, as I mentioned, the, the record of that's slightly mixed, um, but it's definitely a factor and I think nobody anticipates. But you see it in the, mainly in the capital. It's not playing into these local dynamics of specific Well, Bin Rajab watching. actually um, has been a significant, um, and his, um, and basically Namrush was one of the principal go-betweens with Turkey. So actually one of the main reasons that one of the Zawiya axes has been able to become more influential militarily is also because of that sanctioned support from Turkey. So, um, you know, each of these groups to become, as they become bigger, does need to obtain the acquiescence at least of, of the big players outside of the country. And, and so Zintanis were funded by Emiratis in 2011, you know, of course got Haftar. So all of these players have had um, foreign support at different times. They've utilized it to try and pursue their agendas. Sure. Chris. Hi, Kristen Min, a program on violent extremism here at USIP. I'm just curious, uh, your last slide had a bunch of how questions, and you had done some interviews or polling, I'm not sure what, with local community members. I'm just curious if they had ideas about how to do all of those things, and also how, how and who of those local community members need to have a seat at the table, and how can we help ensure that they get there? Thank you. Uh, it's a great question. Actually, I think um, we didn't, at the time of the community interviews, ask them how they thought the security sector should be reformed. Um, we probably should have, to be honest. Um, we were quite careful in some of the way we were asking those questions because these are quite sensitive dynamics. And we were quite keen that the interviews didn't make it seem like we were trying to take out armed groups. Um, but one idea, and I think that um, DCAF is looking at this, and um, is how do you create some kind of accountability mechanism with communities and who in the community should uh, participate in that? Of course, you have municipal councils, but in a number of these instances, the municipal councils have basically surrogates of the armed groups. Um, this is, that's a challenge. Um, I think that having some kind of interface in these cities between the communities and the armed groups that over key issues about weapons management, um, about codes of conduct, I think would be a thing to go that you could rep wait route to go that you could replicate across the country and I think would work quite well. And some people that you'll get into the debate whether that should be through elders or um, you know, pre-existing mediation mechanisms, I think actually it would need to be something quite different and what you would want to target there are some approaches that could be replicated across different geographies that would create kind of like a common baseline. Um, that seems to be the most workable way of achieve, or, or pushing that route. Though, of course, there'll be challenges to that, right? The armed groups will try and penetrate the, the, um, a committee like that. There could be pressure placed upon them. So that's where I think there would be a strong role for the international community to um, support and push those types of efforts. Um, it feels to me that there's a broad consensus or a conclusion that's been drawn by many um, implementers and internationals that coming up with a national SSR strategy 
is very difficult and that there are more opportunities at the local level. But that now needs to be fleshed out into something a bit more strategic that can be replicated because what I see at the moment are largely disconnected efforts looking at different things from pre-DDR to DDR to um, some, some things which are SSR related and there needs to be some kind of common framework that that connects to and I think the, the centerpiece of that should be community accountability. Well, we've run out of time. We've gone over time, but thank you so much, and, and thank you, Tim, for this phenomenal report. Thank you, Deputy Assistant Secretary Morgado, for coming. Thank you, everyone, for, for, for uh, joining us today, and I really encourage you to, to really read the report. It's really fascinating. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Andrew.